All right, everyone. So we're going to start now. Welcome to CS235, Applied Robots Design for Non-Robot Designers. This is lecture 12. And uh, just real quickly, uh, let's do a show of hands. Who has already gone and uh, retrieved their key to gates? OK. Those of you who are not holding up your hands, please do so. Um, show of hands, who's actually retrieved their magnetic access key card to Clark? More of you. Okay, that's good. Is anyone hopelessly lost and found the Cinator? Sorry, Minotaur? Minotaur. The Cinator just blo blocks any legislation from getting passed. Okay, so uh, if you're hopelessly lost, ask someone who actually got their key. Okay, A show of hands. How many people are, have already um, self grouped into groups? Okay, so if you have not already gotten in a group, please do so by the end of today. And um, I need to receive an email from each and every one of you, uh, unless you've already sent it to me, telling me um, what group you're in, uh, who's in your group, and if you're doing sort of the standard robot arm thing, or if you're doing research. And again, remember, uh, if I haven't already spoken with you one-on-one, -on -one, um, then you're doing the robot arm unless you pre-approve the research. Any questions about administrative stuff? Nope? Okay. So uh, today we're going to talk about how to measure things precisely. So this is very important because, um, you know, everyone knows how to use a ruler for measuring tape or, uh, you know, step on a bathroom scale, but compared to the type of precision we need for robotics, um, those are all very imprecise. And I was kind of noticing uh, in office hours that a lot of you know what calipers are and that you're supposed to squeeze them together, but aren't quite sure much beyond that. There are many ways to squeeze a caliper, and uh, only one of them actually results in an accurate measurement. So for some of you, this is going to be massively boring because you already know some of it. None of you have probably measured jello, so that should be new to everyone. Um, and even for those of you who have already used calipers or used some of these other precision instruments, you may learn a, a trick or two that will help you be more accurate. So um, just to start off, we're going to be measuring a bunch of things like distances, outside diameters, inner diameters, the heights of things, uh, all sorts of weird funky geometries that don't fit in between calipers. We'll be measuring forces, weights, um, run out, concentricity, perpendicularity, parallelism, et cetera, et cetera, levelness. <coughs> and um, in most of these instruments, you have um, two choices. You can either do a, a uh, sort of dial gauge, so, or, or you can do digital. And so um, this is the same difference between your your grandfather clock that has hands on it. So this is a dial indicator. And you can see if I press this little lever, actually, can everyone see that? Or should I, are the lights okay in here? You should let me know because it's going to be an entire lecture of this. So if you can't see it now, it's going to be it's a, little dark. a little dark. Okay. Can someone please close the blinds? How's that? Other than the glare. Yeah, well. So everybody see the little red needle? Yeah. So this is a mechanical widget. There's a spring in there, and when you press... Ooh, that's hot. Man. Okay. When you press this little needle, the, um, the little silver thing, the red needle moves. Everyone see that, or is it moving too fast? So that's sort of a manual dial gauge. And then, of course, we could have a digital version of this, um, much as we could have manual watches and we could have digital watches. <clears throat> now, if you read about them, some of them claim there's a difference. I always just look at the precision of the instrument, and as long as the precision has what I want, I go digital because I hate reading little dial gauges. And al al also, dial gauges typically only um, measure in one a method of one unit system. So if you're doing distance, it'll be either inches or millimeters, but digital usually has a button that converts between the two, and a lot of machinists are in inches, and a lot of parts are in millimeters, so you need to be able to convert quickly. So let's start off by talking about calipers. 
and I'm going to move this box over here. So how many of you know what calipers are? Show of hands. How many of you have actually made a measurement with them? And how many of you are confident that you did it correctly? Much fewer, okay. So these are calipers. Now tell me something obvious about this picture. Like, stunningly obvious. It's in a box. This is where caliper should always be unless you're actively making a measurement. So inside these, uh, in the manual version or in the dial gauge version, you have a very tiny little rack and pinion. And if it gets dust in there, it's destroyed, like, like common dust. Uh, in the digital versions, often you have some type of uh, capacitive sensor. And again, if you get dust in there, it's done. It's a little less, uh, uh, it's a little bit more robust than are the digital one, uh, the uh, rack and pinion manual one, but it's still pretty bad. So actually, Rob, at this point, are you trained? Can you please train squarely on the, just zoom in to get the whole screen, and then I'll have you come be my cameraman down here. You got just the whole screen? Good, OK. So today is a lot of weird angles. So Rob's going to help me out. OK. And. It's hard for us to see what's on the screen, so if it looks terrible, can you let us know and we'll adjust the shot? Okay, so the first thing to notice is I've got two jaws, left and right, okay? Now these are hardened, some type of hardened steel. They're not supposed to get nicked or scratched easily, but uh, they will if you drop them. Dropping them will destroy them. Um, pinching too hard on something that's harder can destroy them. Um, banging them against an object that, you know, like a, a lapping stone or uh, something just harder will destroy them. And so we've got two sets here. We've got, these are called the outside jaws, and then these are called the inside jaws. Everybody see that? And so you'll notice here I have sharp surfaces on the inside, and here I have sharp surfaces on the outside. And then let's look at the buttons. So the little green one, can you zoom in, Rob? Okay, the little green one is my on-off switch. Uh, this little yellow one is zero. So basically, if I were to press this right now, now that would read as zero, 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 and anything from that would be incremental. But really what you want to do is you want to close them and hit the zero, and so that's true zero, okay? Now this little gray button here switches between inches and millimeters very quickly, so that's good. Um, but let's talk about something. Um, so I'm just going to kind of touch this and <coughs> okay, and now I'm going to close this again and I'm going to press zero. Now how many of you think that's truly zero, given that I just sort of hacked on it? So it's not. So <coughs> the second cardinal rules of calipers, the first is the box. Keep them in the box. I saw a lot of people grinding steel with the caliper sitting right next to it on a pile of dust. And so we've already lost like $450 worth of calipers in the first two weeks. The second rule is clean calipers. And what else? The object. So basically, uh, the precision on the digital calipers that you'll get either at Osh or at McMaster is about one thousandth of an inch or 0 0.0254 millimeters and a lot of dust is on that scale or bigger. So if I did hack on this and there was dust then all my measurements will be incorrect and you might not even be able to see it. So you don't want to use your fingers because you have crap on your fingers too um, You and you don't want to use Can everyone see that this is textured? Okay, why is this bad? Would you want to clean your glasses with this, for those of you who wear glasses? Why not? Scratches. Um, so the, scratches are, is a great answer. This actually won't scratch it. There's another reason. Small fibers, small fibers left on it. The small fibers from this paper towel will be left on your calipers, and then you're going to be measuring small fibers instead of your object. 
Um, I can't zoom in far enough to show you that, but trust me, anytime you know you like you're wiping your hands with a paper towel and you have residue left over, you're measuring that. So you want to use a cloth that has no fibers that are going to be left behind, and you probably want to do something like an actual glasses cleaner. If it's good enough to not scratch your optics or leave dust, it's good enough for calipers. As I have made myself a custom shirt made out of um, glasses cleaner, <laughs> I'm going to be cleaning this. So let's zoom in here. Okay, you just want to clean the jaws. And again, this is stuff that it's super easy, but you need to make yourself a checklist mentally. If you don't do this, you might as well just get out your measuring tape because it's about as precise. Okay. So here is a uh, here's a, a dowel pin, and I want to measure the diameter. So I just put it in between the jaws. Oh, first let me re-zero. See? Everyone see that number? Is that zero? After I cleaned it, it's no longer zero. We're off by half of one thousandth of an inch. So now I'm going to re-zero, and now I'm really at zero. And I'm going to switch to millimeters for sanity. So I'm going to take my pen and put it in between the jaws, and that reads either 7.99 or 8.0. Now let's zoom in on one of these jaws. Can everyone see the profile of these jaws? So I have a fat part and I have a what? A skinny part. So on here you see how this part right here is kind of sharp and knife-like? So sometimes you just don't have room for these big fat thick ones. But which do you think gives you on average a more accurate uh, reading? Huh? The thick. So for this I have room. So I'm able to just use the thick part. But you can imagine, say, um, can you look up at the board now? You can imagine if I had, um, I don't know, say I had a little pulley. And I wanted to measure this diameter in here. And my caliper was just too fat to fit in there. Then I could use the knife blade to get in here. That'd be fine. But on average, if you can, you want to use the big, the fat part. So let's, let's draw the side profile kind of like this and then that's not a razor's edge it's, it's, it's thin but it, it is existent so if you can you want to use the fat part you may have to use the skinny part uh-huh you want to say how you check if something is out of round? uh... yes so um... ken is talking about being out of round what do you guys think that means just intuitively not yeah so we would like to see if our dowel is a circle and we'll check and see if maybe it's elliptical. So any ideas on how we might do that with calipers? Yeah. I'll switch it off and switch it back on to camera. We have high-tech equipment here, Research University. Okay, so I measure it at this angle and then I rotate and I measure again and I rotate and I measure again and I rotate and I measure again. Now probably the easiest way is just to do uh, 90 degrees. So one, two, and you kind of search to see if you have principal axes for an ellipse. What's the smallest and what's the biggest? But actually this is not the, calipers aren't the best way of doing this. We'll talk about the micrometers next. Okay, so say, so that's the outside and now so these are the these two jaws here are the outside jaws. Let's talk about the inside jaws. What do you think that's good for measuring? Inside. So I don't this is my demo. This is a giant wad of tape. Can we zoom in there? Okay. Everyone see that? So this is not a precise measurement because this is a giant wad of tape, but I just wanted to show you the type of measurement you could take on this. So you know, I can't Clearly, so doing this, where you could line up the outside jaws, you think that's accurate? No, don't do that. The way you want to measure the internal diameter is something like this. Okay? Now let's zoom in on that profile. Can anyone see? It's sharp. It's only sharp. There's no fat piece like on the outside measurement. But it's not like a razor blade. So let me draw something, and Rob, if you can look at the board. Let's draw a circle. 
So this is what we'd like to measure the diameter of. And for the sake of argument, let's let me draw cartoonishly large the calipers. So this is one side, and then this is the second side. Okay, so someone tell me something obvious. It's not, it's not in full contact. My contact points are here, 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 and here. How many contact points would I like? Two. I would like it here and here. This is why measuring the internal diameter of a hole with a set of calipers is not a precise measurement. It's not a good thing to do. And you might think it's close enough. It's not. The precision we need for shafts fitting and bearings and slip fits and press fits, this will bite you in the butt every single time. Don't do it. I will show you another way of doing it. Okay, let's go back to um, let's go back to the shaft. Can you zoom in here? So this is the way we take an external measurement, right? Let's do it on the thin part. Let's say for the sake of argument we're measuring inside the pulley. Everyone see how this is 90 degrees? We want to measure the minimum distance, right? Let me draw something cartoonish. Would you believe it's possible to measure like this? Can you, can you even see what angle that's at? Does that look 90? How about this? Does that look 90? And you'd be amazed at the number of times I watch people do this. They think, okay, well, I have contact and my calipers are tight, so I'm good. No. Watch this. So I put my calipers on here and I have wiggle, okay? What you want to do is very gently kind of wiggle the part. Can you all see me doing that? What do you think I'm doing here? I'm just lightly vibrating the calipers to make sure that I'm getting the minimum distance. So if I start it out at a weird angle and I vibrate, it'll go to the minimum distance. Watch again. Weird angle, vibrate and now I'm at the minimum distance. Everyone see that? And I'm going to draw it on the board just to make sure that's super clear. Okay, so if this is the, the dowel we'd like to measure, we'd like to measure here and here. And sometimes people are doing it one-handed or just being lazy, and instead they'll measure here and here. That's a different, different distance. Don't do that. Wiggle the calipers. It's a trick. Don't do it hard just enough to make sure that you actually have what you think you're going to do. Do you know where this is particularly vicious? Bigger objects. I don't know why, and I'm sure someone can come up with a nice theory for me, but when you're measuring larger objects with the skinny part, it's a lot easier to get that cocking action than on small objects. And you can't even detect it, so you want to make, you want it for big objects with calipers, you want to make multiple measurements and then check later. Or What's the solution to that, given the shape of these outside jaws? We use the fat part. Remember, we have a fat and skinny. The skinny is the one that gets cocked. The fat one doesn't. It's much, if, if uh, you can see that it would be much harder to cock something thick. Wouldn't this be a little bit more obvious than if it was just a tiny, almost razor blade-like sliver? So if you use the fat part of the caliper jaw, outside jaw, it's a lot easier to avoid that. Okay. Now, um, let's zoom in on this again. Today is the boring, the boring lecture that enables you to do the sexy robotics. Anyone see this knob? What do you think that does? Tightens it, okay? So now it doesn't move. So that's valuable in case you want to say, I want something to be installed to 2.339 millimeters. You dial that in, you lock it, and then you're done, okay? How about this thumb wheel? What's the thumb wheel do? Just allows me to make sort of finer, more, more precise adjustments. This is Blair Witch esque. I'm going to keep you awake by making you nauseated. <laughs> okay. All right, let's talk about squeezing. So, I have two objects. One of them is hardened steel. So, I'm just going to apply light pressure, wiggle a little bit, and I'm done. Okay? Don't apply too much pressure. Now, I have a 
piece of plywood. Okay, this is the way to measure it. See how it's along the fat part of the jaws? This is bad. Why? It'll press in. So, <clears throat> you all know about the whole uh, stress, right? Stress is force over area. And let's say we keep that constant. As we use the thinner part, stress goes up. As we use the thicker part, stress goes down. So, if, if we had literally a razor blade and we had two razor blades going together, we'd just cut our part in half, right? So don't use the razor blade unless you absolutely have to because the geometry is such that that's the only thing that will fit in there. As a demonstration, Rob, can you zoom in on this? Practically, how is the skinny edge of these calipers any different from this piece of wire cutters? They're both sharp edges and they're both clamping. So I'm going to take this part, okay, and I'm going to measure real hard because I... I'm devoted to precision, and the harder I press, the preciser my measurement must be. And I'm just going to kind of, kind of, oh man, I can feel the precision oozing out. <laughs> precision is getting everywhere. And now you can see that didn't go so hot, right? <clears throat> so one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to ruin your part, one of three things. Either you're going to ruin your part, and its precision will be lost, or you're going to ruin your calipers, depending on which one's harder the calipers and the material, or, and this is a much more insidious error, nothing is going to be visibly damaged, but your measurement will be completely incorrect, just enough to bite you on the butt. That's the worst one, right? Evil people generally don't have explicit horns and a red tail, they tend to wear suits. They blend in, and this is the, this is the error. If we don't see a mark and our calipers still work, but we press too hard, where do you think we might see this not on wood? Delrin. Delrin is, is a plastic and it's hard enough that we're, we're probably not going to actually leave a mark on it unless you're Superman and it's not going to hurt the calipers but we will squeeze enough to elastically deform it just long enough to get the wrong measurement and then it'll spring back to what it truly is afterwards. Okay. Let me show you um, another tool. This is the only time I'm going to mention this. Well, no, I'll mention this later. Someone tell me to come back to inside micrometers later, please. I'll write it up here. Okay, there, there's one more way that we can use the calipers. Two if we kill someone with them. Okay, zoom in here. See this little thing? So, and zoom, zoom out. So, as I move this jaw, the little skinny protrusion on the back comes out. What can we use this for? Yeah. Depth. So, if I wanted to take this dowel pin, and let's say I put it on something flat, like a parallel. Okay. So, I got my dowel pin dowel pin, it's on something f known to be flat. And can you zoom in, Rob? Okay. Can everyone see this? Let me rotate around. So that would measure the height of the dowel pin. Think this is very accurate? Not particularly. Don't let, cal don't let the precision of the calipers, that being one thousandth of an inch, confuse you with the accuracy. You know the difference, right? Precision is incremental you know, I can tell the difference between two distances repeatedly. That doesn't mean that they're all clustered way off and they're off by an inch because you were abusing the calipers. There's another way. Can you zoom in on this? Uh, everyone see this lip right here? That's the other side of the same thing. We can use this other back side of the calipers like this. Oh, God. Okay, so I can take, I can take my, um, this is like, I feel like I should get an award for doing this in my head. Okay, everyone see that? So I can use the back, I can either use the back fat part of the calipers, or conversely, 
I can use um, this skinny part for measuring height. Okay? But again, that's not a particularly accurate way of doing it. Let's do an example. So for this, I can, I can get nicely on the edge of the object, but what about this roll of tape? Say this is a precision roll of, it's a tape duplicate made out of aluminum or steel. Okay? So I come to the edge and I come down. But you see that? That's why this is not accurate. There isn't enough surface area to ensure that nothing's wobbling. Okay, so um, just to review, we've got calipers. They're on the order of one thousandth of an inch or 0 0.025 millimeters. We got these, Rob, can you look up here? We got these two jaws for outer diameter measurements. Um, one last thing about the inner ones. So this is why we can't do the inner surfaces of holes. What could we measure with the inside uh, jaws of the calipers? Two flat plates. Two flat plates. So if we had, say we had one of those slots I'm very fond of. I could measure here because it's flat, but I could not measure here because we'd have the same problem with circles, right? Yep. So if you do have to measure the inside diameter of a circle, you can't use calipers? No. You just have to recognize that and be accurate? I just wouldn't do it. I mean, there's just no reason. I mean, that would be like, you might as well just pick a number at random. I mean, if here's the thing with imprecision. If I had to choose between being two thousandths of an inch off or being off by an entire inch, I will always choose one inch. Do you know why? Because when you tell me that this is you know, two inches diameter, I look at that and say, no, it's not. You're incorrect. When you tell me it's you know, 1.002 inches and it's off by two thousandths, I can't eyeball that and tell you're correct. It's insidious. You can't get rid of it. You don't know to look. Recently, we just had an example where we had some issues with an air filtration system and they, they took some numbers and they're like, hey, your filtration system isn't up to spec um, and so you guys aren't allowed to use it anymore until you fix it with, for thousands of dollars. And I looked at the numbers and I thought, that's, that's totally way off. I mean, it was off by like over a factor of two. And it was so obvious that I went back and did the math and there was just a simple math error someone had made and we fixed it and we're back up and running. But if they had been off by 10% instead, or 1%, and, and I hadn't noticed it, then we wouldn't have laser cutter. So <clears throat> don't do things like this inside diameter of a hole with calipers, because it'll be off by just enough to make sure none of your fits are correct, but not enough that you're going to recognize it intuitively. So yeah, the inside, the inside jaws are good for flat surfaces. So. Just real quick, I'm going to switch over to the laptop. And um, if it will let me, and Rob, I'll, I still need you there for a sec. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to show you what happens when you drop your calipers, or I'm not sure who did this, or why, or how. This is under a microscope. Does that look good? This happened in the first week of CS235 by an anonymous donor. <laughs> so be careful with, uh, particularly with the inside ones. They tend to get damaged very easily. Okay. So that's calipers. Let's talk about a more accurate way. One of the most common measurements is you're trying to get the outside distance on something or a diameter. <clears throat> so again, the calipers are good to about 1,007 inch or 0 0.0254 millimeters. Does anyone know, um, can you, camera again? Does anyone know what these things are? Huh? Micrometers. Micrometers. How many of you have heard of them? How many of you have used them? much fewer and how, how many of you think you know how to use them well? Okay, so about two. So micrometers are the gold standard for measuring outside diameters on things. If you have an argument with someone about what size something is, this will always settle it. So these ones for McMaster 
are accurate down to 0 0.001 millimeter, one micron. That's really tiny. So that's um, that is uh, way better than the cal the calipers. The calipers were 0 0.025, and these are 0 0.001, so over an order of magnitude. And so the way these work is you have can you zoom in a little bit. You have two jaws, and then you put the object in between. Can you see this okay? And then you tighten it down. Now, let's, the tightening mechanism is special, and let's uh, look at that. I have two knobs. This knob is direct drive. If I spin that as hard as I can, it will clamp as hard as it can. This is spring-loaded. So if you're making a gross measurement, like say it was set at a small gap and now you're measuring something really big, you can use the direct drive to go really quickly. But as you get in, as you're converging on your, um, your final measurement, you only want to use a spring-loaded one because it will slip at the predetermined force so it doesn't deform what it is you're measuring. And again, don't try to measure jello with this. You want to keep in mind that the hardness of your material and its elastic deformation for this, this um, measuring force is important. So let's, I'm going to go until we hit. Now, I've already cleaned these, but these, it's even way more important to clean than it is with the... Um, Calipers. You'll actually notice the reading changing every time as you clean it. That's right at zero, zero. Now everybody listen. So I'm going to back off. Okay? It's a little gap. Listen. That's slipping right at zero. So now I'm going to back out. Now my micrometer is a little awkward to handle. So it'll, it'll take you some getting used to, but it's well worth the wait. So I'm going to put my dowel in here. Just in the middle. I'm going to use the spring-loaded thing. Okay, and this says it is 7.997 millimeters. 7.997. Let's write that down. Now I'm going to come back over to the calipers. 7.99. So the calipers say 7.99. Now, the shafts that we've all been using for labs one and two have a tolerance of um, plus 0, 0.000 millimeters and minus 0 0.009 millimeters. And the difference is this one won't fit at all and you have to sand outside for half an hour and this one will fit with zero sanding. If you measure with calipers, which a lot of you were smartly trying to do to figure out, hey, which ones have to sand and which ones don't, you're going to have a hard time figuring out which one has to be sanded and which doesn't just with calipers. See? This could be, um, we could go anywhere with calipers from a zero, which would uh, be roughly at the outer limit here, to a nine, which would be roughly at the upper limit there, right? So basically, this this specification for the tolerance, which is the difference between sanding or not sanding for the next lab, you can't even tell with calipers. You have to get out the micrometers to tell. Everyone clear on this? Please don't use calipers for this. It, it, it just, it's wasting your time. Only use micrometers. Okay. So, this, micrometers are only for making outside measurements, right? And um, they make micrometers in various sizes. Uh, I was in a machine shop once, and the, machine, the machinist was real proud. He had one from World War II, and it was the length of this table. Like, I'm not joking. And they were measuring, like, bombs or something. Um, I think he had a complex. I think he built it just for fun. But they, they, they range from half inch to, like, you know, size of the table. So that's external micrometers. And that ratchet is super important. Using micrometers without the ratchet is as bad as just using calipers. Let's talk about how we would measure this with a micrometer. How would we measure, we don't want to use calipers because we don't have point contacts. How would we take that pair of micrometers and measure the internal diameter of this hole? Could you do kind of like what you did with the inside jaws of the caliper? Can you extend something down from the micrometer and back it out? I, th I think I know what you're saying, and I think you're correct. 
And that's amazing that you just thought of that on your own because I always thought this was like a, wow, that's clever. Like really, I would never imagine to do this. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a circle and it's called, uh, I don't even know what it's called. It's called, there are two things. One's called an outside micrometer. I don't remember what they are or how they work. And the next thing, which is not that, I don't remember what it's called, but just search on McMaster for a while, they do sell them. So basically what it is, is it's a set of half balls and I can spread them that way, right? So I could either have them spread like this for big holes, and then this would be the minimum hole size, right? So what I do is I spread these until they're here, and this is rigid, so, and then I back off just enough that I can actually take it out of the hole, and then I stick that in between my outside micrometers, right? Everyone see that? So let's pretend my hands, and why does this work and this doesn't? It's curved. it's curved. I have point contacts. So if my hands were these hemispheres, I'd spread them until I am stuck, come in a tiny bit, just enough to take it out, take it out, and then put it in between the jaws of my outside micrometer. So that's a really good way of doing that. <clears throat> let's talk about one last type of my. Uh -huh. Is there something that would actually just have those teeth so you don't have to like take them out? Like it's just that process is... Yeah, there might, I think there is. I don't remember, that might be that the inside micrometer. I don't really remember. I, well, I learned this at the Varian Physics Shop. This is how they were doing it. Uh huh. Could, could you describe again how this inside thing works? Yeah, so basically imagine <clears throat> I have a little device on the end of a skinny stick with two hemispheres. Okay, two hemispheres, and then I'm able to spread them apart with a little screw. So I spread them apart until it reaches the outside of the inside of my hole. And then I take them out and I put them in between the jaws of my outside micrometer. So I use the same micrometer for measuring this, and that gives me the diameter of the hole. Is that clear? Yeah. So it's adjustable with light. Exactly. So. Yeah. So I could t I could put it in a half inch hole, and then I could put it in an inch hole, and the minimum is basically when the hemispheres are touching. And uh huh. You're still using precision though, right? Because you're taking it slightly. Yeah, you are. Which is why you would want what Shruti said, which is you'd want something that has those internally. Like it's you don't remove it, you, you measure in inside of it. And they exist. Those might be the inside micrometers, I don't remember. I've only ever seen this at Varian. And I think I looked for the other one and it was too expensive, I couldn't afford it. So And we're gonna in just a few short minutes we're gonna get to uh, another way of doing this. Okay, there's one last type of micrometer, which is called a depth micrometer. Rob? Okay. This is a depth micrometer, otherwise known as the machinist sword. Um, so the way this works is, again, it has in this case, it's a little friction knob, but it's the same thing as a ratchet knob. It's just meant to slip at a predetermined force. And then as I spin that, this, uh, basically I'm measuring from between this face and this face, right? Here and here. Now, let's go back to our um, tape demo. Say this was a precision part and not duct tape. This, with the calipers, wiggles back and forth, right? That's bad. My depth micrometer sits on both sides. See? So it's much more stable. There's no wiggle. So that's why it's particularly good for doing like holes and stuff. And then you may have noticed this is a really long, um, I don't know what this is called, but basically a really long stem, and it's actually longer than the overall instrument. So the way this works is you have a set of differently sized, well, I had a set of differently sized um, stems, so let's zoom in on this. So see, I've got muy pequeño and the medium one and the big one, and they go up in inch increments. 
so that you can measure anywhere from you know half an inch to or or you know zero to like five inches. And if you again, they have ones that are super ridiculously long for like taking down Hitler. So uh, that's a depth micrometer. And just as a real example, why would we want to use this other for then for measuring duct tape? Here's the example. So this is a tube, and some delightful person has pressed for the bearing in here, so I can't get it out. But it's okay. I want to use this tube. The only thing is I don't know what bearing this is because I can't take it out. So I'd like to measure the distance from this outside edge to the inner race in the black abyss within. Let me put some light on that so we can see that abyss. Oh, it's still an abyss. How about that? All right, see that, that iteration there? So the best way of doing that would be a depth micrometer where I would stick it in here and then I would um, basically line it up with the uh, outer race of the bearing. And again, I'm not going to wiggle like with the calipers once it's actually on. That's a really precise way of measuring this. So depth micrometers are typically used for holes because um, uh, for like long shallow holes. So we could, uh, in terms of the depth, you just can't fit a caliper in there. All right, so that's the last type of micrometer. So we've talked about calipers, outside micrometers, depth micrometers, inside micrometers. This is a pain in the butt. So I'm going to show you a different way. Okay, does anyone know what's in this box? Pin gauges. Rob, can we, can you come from above? When I open this, I want it to be like a Hark the Herald Angel Sing moment. Can you come up here? Okay. So look at all these shinies. Can you get up a little higher? Okay, I have four boxes of these, ranging all the way from point point two two millimeters to ten millimeters. And I don't know if you can tell or not, they basically all look alike side by side. Okay. They come in increments. Anyone want to guess the increment? The pin gauges come in increments of point oh two millimeters. So I have from point two two all the way to 10 millimeters, and they sell them above that, but this is just you know, pretty standard, which means I've got about a gazillion of them, and they all look alike, but they all have printed on them what it is. Now, 0.02 millimeters is about one thousandth of an inch, which is typically you know, a standard difference between like a slip fit and a press fit, depending on the materials. So, can you, if any of you ever become famous and want to donate, as alumni to this course, can you get me a camcorder that doesn't give us taunts during lecture? Okay, so this is one of these uh, flange bearings you've been using. And uh, this right here is a 7.98 millimeter pin gauge. And then this one right here is an 8 millimeter one. So, the 8 millimeter one, I'm not going to jam in because it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. And But I really want to. Um, see if maybe one notch down does. Nice slip fit, see? So that's only a difference of 0 0.02 millimeters. So if you only need to measure the hole within 0 0.02 millimeters or roughly one thousandth of an inch, pin gauges are awesome, right? Because you just go through the pins until you find the right one when it fits in. So if you had a slip fit, let, let's, do, let's see who's awake. This is 7.98 and it's a slip fit. What do you think I would do for a press fit? The next one up. Now, this isn't as precise, perhaps, as you could get with the inside micrometers. But just to tell you, when this was useful, I had a machine. I had a plate that was four foot by three feet by half inch steel machined for me last summer. So that's big. So that's that's about four feet by three feet by half inch thick. That's gigantic out of steel and then I had them nickel plated and I had some very precise location dowel pins to align the different parts of my robot and they screwed it up <coughs> terribly 
and my location pins wiggled. And they told me, well, hey, you're, you know, we hit the tolerance for slip fit. And I think I looked it up and it was like two thousandths is allowable for a slip fit. So I took my little trusty little pin gauges and jammed them in there and it took me 30 seconds to figure out actually they'd given me five thousandths, which is like double the specification. And I didn't need the extra precision, right? Because the spec was two thousandths and I had increments of one thousandths and I found the one that was a, you know, per fit perfectly for five thousandths. I called them up and said, you're incorrect. And I didn't make them redo it, but I could have and they would have had to pay for it. So know wit when you need extra precision. Micrometers are awesome, but you don't always need them. Pin gauges are like super easy and quick to use. We're going to come back to pin gauges later. Um, actually, you know what? Let's do them now. Remember how I was talking about um, we want Sometimes we want to be able to install things to a precise depth even if we're not going to keep the stuff in. Pin gauges are your best friend ever for installing things to precise depths without keeping it in. So you need a random number? Cool, we got all the random numbers. <laughs> Chances are we got somewhere damn close to it. I need 3.52 millimeters. Boom, I got it. If I need something in between that and 3.5, eh. So, as an example, I'm going to introduce you to something that you don't know about yet. Just long enough to show you, to motivate this. So let's talk about a linear bearing. And this is one spe specific type of linear bearing. Uh, some people call it a linear, uh, what's it called? Linear guide bearing. I call it a reciprocating ball bearing, a, a linear reciprocating ball bearing. Don't worry about it. We'll get to this next week or the week after. The basic message is if, if we look at it lengthways, this is the rail, and then this is the head. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to bolt the rail down to a, pla a plate, and then this head is free to move back and forth, right? So it's linear motion. Now let's look at it this way. Um, let's look at it um, head on. So this is my rail and then this is my head. Okay, everyone see how this works? Pretty simple. Two parts. Rail, head, the head moves and the rail is stationary. Okay, now let's look at it from the third and last angle above. Okay, now I want to make sure that this is perfectly horizontal for my application. I can take two dowel pins and put one right here and one right here, right? Don't worry about the back and forth. I only want to make sure it's horizontal. Does everyone see that these, can you come over here a little bit? It's hard to see. No. Oh, okay. No, yes. Short cords, everyone. So, uh, can everyone see how these two dowel pins would align this horizontally? Okay. Now, let's look at what it looks like here. Okay. So, tell me what's happening in these two pictures. Why do I need to insert these dowels? Let, let me, okay, let me stop for a sec. I want this head to be able to get past those dowels. Because I, these things are precious and every millimeter you add adds like five bucks. So I would like to get as much travel as possible from this. So I don't want to have to take up a good centimeter of travel on either end for my dowel pins. So I want my head to be able to get past the dowel pin. Can you see that the dowel pin is necessarily going to clip the head? unless that pin is precisely located beneath the head. Everyone see that? So if this is my linear head and it's moving a straight line back and forth, what's going to happen is if this is my dowel pin and we're up here, I'm going to clip it and then I'm losing distance. So instead I'm going to take it down and I'm going to be able to go past, okay? But I have to be able to install it to precise depth to do that. So we're going to use dowel pins. So the sizes I've been using for my dissertation robot, typically you install to 2.5 millimeters. Okay. Yep. If you're machining acrylic or metal parts, can you still 
still use dollop into the line? Or would you have to one, one last time. We're machining metal or acrylic. Uh, well, metal is very different from acrylic. I would argue acrylic sucks and you shouldn't use it. Um, it's very brittle. And press fitting things into brittle materials is very dangerous. So I've sort of banned acrylic from our shop, also because it smells terrible. Um, and then I need... Cool. Okay. Oh. So let's zoom in here. Okay, so this is a plate that I laser cut as an example. And I got three holes. I figured I could screw up on one of them. Let's say for the sake of argument, I only want to press fit dowel pins into two of them. Okay? So here are my dowel pins. Any ideas on how I'm going to install those to exactly 2.5 millimeters? So first I'm going to draw it out on the board. Oh, hey. You know what? I've been dumb. If I raise this, the camera's still... Oh, wow. This blew my mind. Okay, so say this is the surface of our plate. Okay. And say this is the line for 2.5 millimeters above. <laughs> oh, God. Can you um, turn the camera off? And then it'll just at least be a... Yeah, there we go. Oh. Okay, so 2.5 millimeters above this plate is where I want... Ultimately, I would like the head, the head of this pin to be here. So it comes up straight. Then we have some convexity, and then we're there. And it'll be necessarily sticking out somewhere there. Okay, but I want the head at 2.5 millimeters because my the the head of my linear slide is going to be right here. It's going to clip otherwise. I think that gives me 0.5 millimeters of gap. You can be a little lower. Right? I mean, the dowel pin is going to hold tiny, even if you're a little bit inside the material. This profile. I'm going to zoom in for you. Okay. That profile is really an actuality. So. This is the profile you think you have looking dead on for your linear guide. Okay? So what you're saying is why don't I just put the dowel pin right here? Even lower? A little bit lower, yeah. Not like all the way, but I mean halfway, yeah. Halfway? Yeah. Okay, how about like that? Or how about like that? Yeah, that's hard to figure that out. Okay. The reason is that they chopped this off. This is chamfered. And they give you a range. They say it will be blah to blah, I don't know, 0.5 millimeters. So now we just lost ourselves 0.5 millimeters. And uh, I'm not accusing any companies except for the fact that I have received parts from Asumi where this chamfer was not within specification. So I put, I always like at least a gap of 0.5 millimeters for things to be misaligned. So I put the dowel as high as I can with still 0.5 millimeters just in case they decide to screw me and make this chamfer bigger. Okay. Um, so, now, this dowel pin is going to start out, when we're trying to install it, it's going to start out like this, right? So this is pre-installation. This is when we're just trying to insert it into the hole, and this is perfectly inserted. What's the step in between? The step in between is two pin gauges. So, You take a 2.5 millimeter pin gauge and another 2.5 millimeter pin gauge. Then you take a parallel that's nice and flat and stiff and you push on it. Okay? And then this plate is going to push until it's resting on the two pin gauges and then in between. There's our dowel. This is like the best trick ever. Everyone see how this works? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you real quick, mainly because I want to torture Rob with the camera. You can hold all that together with one hand? Huh? You can hold all that together with one hand? Yeah, uh, two hands. Okay, so I'm going to get my dowel pin started. Okay. Oh, hey, thanks. You get jello later. You're on my list. You're on my jello list. Okay. So here's my pin. It's barely started. 
So I take my two dial pins. Now in this case I don't have two sets. I'm using one 2.5 and one 2.48. But that's, I mean if you get a dial pin to within one thou, that's ridiculous. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to put it on here. And then I'm going to put here, and actually, Ellis, can you give me a hand please? I lied. <laughs> it depends on the geometry. Okay, just go ahead and press uh, press down. I don't think you need the feet, right? I mean, the, edge, the end of the, the press is pretty flat, no? No, it's not pretty flat. Okay, you're good? Okay, and now, can you zoom in, Rob? See that? See that, how the dowel pin is right next to the pin gauges? And now, I'm just going to verify pretty quickly with my handy dandy calipers on the back fat end. Let's, just as another example, see that? See how I'm using them? Okay. And it is, these are not thick enough. I'm not joking, they're not thick enough. This is why you don't use calipers for doing stuff like this. It's really accurate. This, I think it's 2.48. They should be, theoretically, they should be the exact same diameter, yes. But, I mean, you're talking about um, if you spread them out and then you only have a difference of one thou and then you're working on some type of Pythagorean something, then it's going to be even less than that. So don't worry about it. Now, the key to pin gauges is the moment you're done with them, put them back because they're expensive. Okay, so that's pin gauges. Screws. Let's talk about screws. Now, you all will get an intuitive sense for this. McMaster doesn't sell randomly sized screws. They may seem random to you, but they're not. They come in millimeter increments. Masumi doesn't order randomly sized screws. If you see a screw, it's some type of whole number in terms of its length. So, you'll get used to being like, hey, that's 12 millimeters because you've used a billion of them. But it's okay for now, you know. It's cool. If you're trying to figure out is this an M4 and M3, what do you do? That's the next part. We'll take the calipers. So this one's 2.96. This one's 3.97. Round to the nearest whole number. It's not exact. Okay, so one's roughly four and the other's roughly three. Great. Well, three what? There are different uh, pitches or the distance between adjacent teeth for screws. So like recently in our air filtration system, I took out this custom screw and it was an M10. And I was like, sweet. So I went on McMaster order and it was like M10 by 1, M10 by 1.25, and M10 by 1.5 millimeters. So let me write that down. Can you... So that's... M10 by, and we had 1.00, 1.25, and 1.50 millimeters. Okay? Now, Rob, I want you to zoom in on this. This is something I've done for many years, and I have watched students do for many years, and it is really terrible. So you take the calipers, and you put it here along the screw, and you start you measure that distance and then you start counting. Um, if you're doing inches, you're doing threads per inch. So it's not, it's not a pitch where it's like, you know, one millimeter, it's threads per inch. So not only do you measure an inch and count the threads, then you divide. So now I'm just gonna take my calipers and put it in here. I, these are tiny threads. I actually can't, I physically can't see it. I can't tell the difference between one and 1.25. Does anyone know what we do? Oh, by the way, this is one of the prime ways of destroying your calipers. Screws are pretty hard. So if I keep doing this and rubbing them against each other, I'll destroy the tips of my calipers. This is a handy dandy screw pitch gauge. So what this is, is basically a Swiss Army knife composed of all different uh, standard screw pitches. And they sell them both for metric as well as imperial. And they're each labeled what the pitch is. So this is an M4. Anyone know what the pitch is on an M4? 0. 0.7. Okay. So here's how it goes. You start around what you think just looks eyeballing correct. Can you zoom in, please, Rob? Uh, 
Can can anyone see this? Does that look correct? Way too big. So then you start going back until you actually find the one that adds up. So I've got, this may be sort of a tricky shot and you may need to go to manual focus. Or, hey, I have a microscope, don't I? Fascinating. Switch to this real quick. So you go until it fits perfectly? You go until it fits perfectly, just like a nut on a screw. And I'm a, I'm a, if I can switch over to the laptop, I will show you. But if you can't eyeball the threads, or then how can you know? Well, you'll, you'll see momentarily. Okay, so. Oh, God. So that's point seven five, and this is point... Man, these are all out of whack. Examples are only good when they work. Okay, here we go. Point seven. And hopefully you guys will be able to see. Yeah, it works. Okay, can everyone see this? Rob, can you focus for me? Where's the focus? Uh, it's the little black knob on the left. Okay. Does everyone see how that fits perfectly? The silver is my pitch gauge and the black are the threads of my screw. Everyone see how every single valley go goes with a corresponding mountain? That's 0.7 millimeters. So now I'm going to take a 0.65. That's only off by 0.05 millimeters. Oh, it looks the same on the microscope. Everyone see how that doesn't work? Some of them fit and some of them don't. So that's how you do it. This is actually like, you're free to play after class. It, like, you can tell instantaneously if it works or not. Either it fits and you'll hear like a little click and all of them pop together, or it only fits on like one tooth or every tenth tooth and then after that it doesn't fit. So that's just a real quick way you use this set you measure the outer diameter of the screws, you say M what, and then this gives you the, you could go on McMaster and type in M10, it tells you the available pitches for M10, that gives you a good starting, right? So you don't need to start at 0.5 if it's an M10, you should start more around 1. And then this helps you determine 1, 1.25, or 1.5. So that's screws. Any questions about that? Uh huh. So in Imperial versus metric, uh, in Imperial we'll have threads per inch, like quarter 20 is 20 threads per inch, where here it's the distance second numbers of between individuals. So you know. Yes. Uh, try not to use Imperial. What's going to happen is someone's going to sell you a widget and they'll be an idiot and they'll sell it to you with Imperial bolt patterns. That's usually when you'll be forced to use it. But So just to, what Ken's talking about is um, in metric this is the pitch, right? And say one millimeter. Now, in Imperial, what they'll do is they'll give you an inch worth, so one inch, and then they'll count the number of threads, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's eight threads over one inch, and it'll be called 8 TPI, 8 TPI. So you can see how annoying that is. Okay. Come on. Let's see what else we got. Um, yep. Okay. Now, I want to make sure, I know some of you have to leave early, so I'm going to go ahead and skip to Jello because Jello is fun. Okay, so I have too much jello. I hate jello. At camp, what they would do is they would take random leftovers and embed it in jello, and somehow that made 
the formerly un, uh, unpalatable leftovers palatable. So I have, I have flashbacks and PTSD from it. I'm hoping some of you don't. So whoever doesn't hate Jello and gets a correct answer will get a Jello cup. And I have orange and red. It really doesn't mask the flavor when they put beef stroganoff inside, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay, so here's my question. Yeah. Oh, I forgot real quick. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. Yeah. yeah, I'm not eating that. It's disgusting. Okay, I forgot. This was hiding on my, on my table. What's this? <laughs> Don't use them. This is terrible. Don't even have it in your tool set. Shame on you for thinking this should be in your tool set. This is very inaccurate. Buy your set of, set of calipers. They're 30 bucks from Osh. They're perfectly good. Don't get the plastic type. Get the metal type. Don't even use this. This is another form of that. Don't buy this either. This is bad. This is a T-square. It's also a ruler and it's terrible. Don't use it. Okay, so I got my Jello. Now some of you are thinking, Ruben, why are you measuring Jello? I know some of you are medical roboticists, as I am. And so the human body is typically squishy unless we've already implanted something. And you need to be able to take measurements on anatomical models and specimens and phantoms. So in my own personal research, I have um, basically f through the UCSF World Body Program, I get cadaver hands and then I test that in my IV insertion robot. Because if you want to take data on a medical robot, it makes sense to do it on as close to a live human as possible without actually doing a live human for FDA reasons. Latex tubes just aren't that realistic. Great. So in my case, if I get Mr. Cosby's hand donated, and I need to measure how jello like it is. Then I take his hand, and I know this is gross, but you, this, uh, Rob, let's do some camera work. No one got the Mr. Cosby reference at all? Jello. Okay. So you can see, if I'm measuring the diameter of one of his fingers, this is not particularly accurate, right? And if this wasn't protected in a plastic, let's just, someone already ruined these calipers, so I'm just going to, oh, <laughs> squishy. Okay, so that begs the question, uh, how do we measure things that are squishy? And so, you know, if you're doing anything softer than like a Delrin, I just wouldn't use calipers or micrometers, it's just a waste of your time. Does anyone know what an optical comparator is, or just a comparator? Optical, and Rob, can you um, can you head back and man the main camera, please? Hey, there's hand sanitizer. Okay. So an optical comparator is a camera with very precise optics, capable of actual making measurements based on the image. It goes by both comparator and optical comparator. 218ers, please do not confuse this with a Schmidt trigger. It is not. Okay, so this is called a dino light. They're awesome. It may seem silly because it's USB, but there's a lot of serious science that takes place with dino lights. So I have this little calibration rig here that comes with it. And basically what I do is I put it somewhere that I think is good. And then I go in here to calibration. Okay, now you see these little, can everyone see the lines here? So you align those lines on your calibration rig to the best of your ability. Now notice this isn't like at nice vertical and horizontal. I'm able to do whatever. Everyone think that's lined up pretty well? Okay, now that's how many millimeters is that? Five. five, so I enter the number five, and then finish. Now let's test it. I can click somewhere on the image. So this is one, two, three, four, five. And note it gives me down to one micron. Now I don't remember what their specification is in terms of precision, and I know it depends on the magnification and the 
alignment and all of this stuff, but it's actually really good. Okay, so now that we've verified, after we calibrated, that's actually too big, so let's go up here. That's 5.04 millimeters. That's pretty good. Let's look at some jello. So this is a cube of jello I cut out. Okay. So I take my measurement here and say I would like to measure from between this edge. Now, this isn't a square edge, but what's that number say? Any, can anyone read that? 7.197. Let's do another one. Let's do a vertical measurement from here to, I don't know, let's do the other line because I can see that, 3.502. You can see it's really easy. Let's do a diagonal measurement. Okay, we can do that. We can also do weird stuff like we can draw a circle and it will tell us the precise diameter of that circle. Now there are, there are you know, 20,000 versions of these in real machine shops that, and they're good enough that, I mean, they use these on a daily basis to make very precise measurements. Non-invasive, non-destructive for squishy stuff. Can you imagine when I would want to use an optical comparator for making measurements on hardened parts, but still I want to use the optical comparator? So think in your, huh? Thin wall. Thin wall, yeah. Maybe we have a, you know, a stint for a, a medical device and it's like you can't even see how thin that wall is, so you're going to use the optical comparator for that. How about something where the geometry just doesn't lend itself to being measured? So. Um, let me zoom out. So, you're about to see an IV needle, and it will appear that there is some blood on it. That is not real blood, that is fake blood. Don't be nervous. Is there fake blood? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I have to test with non cadavers before I test cadavers. Okay? So, can, every, can everyone see how there's kind of a conical section to it? How would you measure that with a caliper? You can't. It's physically impossible. Okay? So there are some things. I actually have a version of this made out of brass as a dummy IV needle. So it's hard enough I could use calipers. It's not going to deform. But I still just physically can't measure the geometry because how, how do you measure the tiny little radius? This is all radius. Nothing is flat here or, or infinitely small radius. How do I measure this with calipers? I can't. Now here's the thing. Does everyone see how this is cocked at a weird angle? Anyone know what depth of field is? So let me zoom in and out here. Say I want to get, I want to get crisp on just the very top hub. Everyone see how the, the bottom of the cone is blurry? Even though the top of the needle is crisp? All right, so now let me, let me crisp down on the little part. Now I see how it, oh, it was crisp. See how it's crisp for the small part of the hub, but now it's blurry for the top? Depth of field. So this is one of the limitations of, uh, optical comparators is of depth of field. Uh huh. When you do the, the magnifying stuff, does it change the scale? Do you have yeah. So every time you change the magnification, you have to recalibrate. Okay. Anyone know how? At, at the very least, I should put this at an angle so I'm looking directly up and down. See how this is bad? It's angled, but this would be much better. See that? Any ideas for how we do that non destructively? Someone tell me what this is. Wax. Huh? Wax. It's not wax. It goes where wax is, though. These are CVS brand silicone earplugs. They're the best thing ever. We'll be using these for installing cables for cable cap stands and also for holding randomly shaped things non-destructively. So I'm going to take this here needle. I'm going to take this here silicone earplug, mush them together. It's soft enough. It's not going to hurt anything. Then I put it on my table. Okay, and now I'm free to adjust. I can set it at a weird angle or I can straighten it out to where it's straight and then I can come back in here and I can, if I had recalibrated, then I could do something like I could measure the distance from the end of the cone to the base of the cone here. Now again, that's something that I could never, 1.636 if this were calibrated, that's something I could never hope to do with calipers, see? 
Um, as you calibrate, don't you have to measure the same slave as the calibration device? Yes. So the, the trick, uh, what, what Ken's asking about is if we um, say this is the microscope imager right here, and then this is where we put our little calibration rig. To make it as accurate as possible, you need to then put the surface of whatever it is you're measuring right there so that you don't have issues in terms of, of the depth. And so that's something you'll need to keep in mind in terms of how you do that. What, what do you think you could use to put this calibration rig at a precise distance? Two pin gauges. Booyah. Uh-huh. Uh, I know you're using that to straighten it, but we just talked about things that we can't reach. Things that we can't reach. Like, um, or, okay, I'll ask you later. So, I mean, we could take the thin wall tube and stuff that on the silicone earplug and then walk it back and forth until it's straight up and down. Okay. Let's do some more. So we've done, let's talk about perpendicularity, shall we? Uh, or should I go in order? Uh, we'll go quickly. How do you measure force? There are many answers to this. You could get an ATI, an Anno 17, or, or a Mini 40. That'd be awesome. I mean just like, how much does this weigh? Bathroom scales suck. They're typically for 200 pounds. The air is huge. This, it, you'll be way off for something smaller. Unless you're measuring 200 pound objects, don't use a bathroom scale. This is called a fish scale. It's for weighing fish. So you take a cup, like so, to hold your object, put it on the end here. You hang this from the ceiling. So if, next time you're in the back room, notice there's a stainless steel cable tied to the ceiling, taped up. That's where I measure all of my fish. And then I can either I can, so I can zero this so that it doesn't register the weight of the cup, and then I put my object in here, okay? It's called a fish scale. They're pretty cheap on master. And this one's good down to like, you know, 10 grams. So that's how you hang, hang weights there. That's, that's often for really big things, like a big trout. Um, and then this... This, I'm going quicker and quicker because I'm, I'm reverting back to your, all of your guys' like high school chemistry labs. If you want a more, ac a more accurate and precise measurement of mass for smaller objects, you're going to use this. So this is just a little digital scale. And so you have some type of container. Now you're thinking, I'm a roboticist. Why does this matter? I never weigh things. Two reasons. Three reasons. One is counterbalances. If you need, um, Rob, can you follow me? As you will discover in, in the next lab, say I have a, say I have a one degree of freedom haptic device, and I want to apply forces here, and it's able to rotate about this pivot. If I have all the the center of mass right here, then my motor has to fight that to keep it up, right, to float. If I put a giant mass over here, then it'll float as long as the, the torques are the same. Okay? Now, say this is a chunk of aluminum or tungsten or steel. Anyone know off the top of their head what the density of their material is? How about tungsten? What's the density of tungsten? Grams per cc. Huh? Heavy. It's heavy. <laughs> heavy is not a number. So you buy your material from, say, McMaster, and they're going to give you one level of uh, better precision, which is it's pretty heavy. <laughs> so basically, before you get your, what I do is before I get my counterbalances machined, I get my precision chunk from McMaster. I measure the um, distances with calipers, so I have the volume. Then I put it on my gram scale, so I have the mass, and then mass over volume and I have my actual density, and then I update my CAD, and then I send it to the machinist, and then I have a very super ultra precise counterbalance, which is very important in a lot of instances. So, in terms of robotics, you'll be weighing things to figure out their density for counterbalances. Also, all of you enjoyed that 3D printing experience, no? None of you used the sodium hydroxide, which is good because it will blind you. So basically, you know the support material you had to wash off? And you know how the, your bevel gears probably went ka-clunk, ka-clunk, ka-clunk? 
That's because you didn't get all the support material off. To get the support material off, you have to eat it off with a strong base called sodium hydroxide. So, see that remnant? That's sodium hydroxide. So you put this on here, 114.1 grams, I zero it. Now I add in my sodium hydroxide, then I weigh my water, mix it together to 4%, and then I clean your guys' gears. So I'm saying this because typically, I, you know, I hadn't used this until I got to grad school, except for like high school or college chemistry, but it actually matters. Uh, and this is good to down, down to 0.1 grams. Okay. Say you need a known weight. Yes. Uh, dynamic loads. Dynamic loads. You need an actual force sensor, like um, like an ATI, something that you know what the refresh rate is and the precision. His his question was dynamic versus static force measurements. I'm only talking about static today. Dynamic is a whole other mess of fish that cannot be measured with the fish scale. Anyone know what these are? They're not doorknobs. These are calibration weights. So say you don't want to measure some random object. Say you want to put a known force on something. I would like to put a kilogram on my hand because it's fun. So I take my kilogram weight and this is pretty precise. And a lot of the stuff from McMaster comes with um, certification forms from NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, to tell you that it's within spec and it's been measured. And so I have one kilogram, 500 grams, 200, 100, 50, 20, 10, 5, 2, and 1. So just another quick example of, hey, I do robotics. I will never need to do that in a million years. So I did an ex a clinical experiment where I took IV needles and I, had, I instrumented them to record motions and forces and accelerations, et cetera, and et cetera. And then I had anesthesiologists insert them per typical insertion, and I just recorded all the data on them. And one of the things I used was, has anyone ever seen the, the FSRs, the force sensitive resistors um, flexiforce? So you've got a little area, and when you press on it, the, um, the resistance does something like this with force. And then you can do a nice little 218 circuit and turn that into um, voltage. Okay. How do you think you, you think those have nice, nice curves? They're monotonic, I'll give you that. So they're never decreasing, but maybe it's something like that. How do you figure that out? You take data points. So one, two, three, four. How do you think you take data points on it? With calibration weights. So say we take this and we put it down right there. This is looking side on. Okay? So I want to know what one kilogram of force looks like in terms of voltage. So I'm going to put this massive weight on it. Let me draw this in a different color. Does anyone think this will work? Or not? Doesn't cover the whole thing. Any clue how we could get around this? We use a puck. So if I have a third color, you make yourself a little, hey, that's blue, that doesn't work. You make yourself basically something that, that gives you the correct surface area. So, if this is your sensor, and this is your weight, then you make a little puck that sits on here. Okay? So the puck goes perfectly over the area of the sensor. Anyone know why? Why don't we, if we do a needle point, it'll puncture. They actually have accuracy specifications. I think you need like 70% contact surface area for it to work properly. So we make a puck that's, you know, 90% of our FSR surface sensing, and then we make this bigger to take our massive kilogram. I'm saying all of this not for randomness sake, but because you will be using little calibration weights for doing things like calibrating FSRs. Turns out they're pretty reliable once they're calibrated, as long as you don't shear them or apply tension. Anything else? How about haptic devices? What could I use little calibration weights for for haptic devices? I could me measure the stiction. I have little weights. So say I have, um, say I have, um, I'm going to do a linear bearing because we just introduced those. And I have some type of motor that's able to pull this way, right? And then I'm going to take a string and I'm going to put a pulley and then bring it down here. 
and I'm gonna have a little Dixie cup and then I'm gonna put a 10 gram weight in here and I'm gonna increase it and increase it increase it until it starts pulling and that lets me know what the starting friction is for my haptic device this is how I characterize the spherical haptic device okay what is a cheap version of calibration weights synonymous with fun in the sun and you can get a scholarship to do it for college Waters. Huh? Quarters. I can't, I can't hear you. Quarters. Quarters. I'm not sure what fun you're having. <laughs> I don't want to know. Water will fry your electronics. That's a good try, but it will fry everything. Sand. So why are we filling this cup with little calibration weights? We could fill it with sand. Why fill it with sand? We could fill it with lead shot, with steel shot, with tungsten shot. We'll talk about filling cups with various types of particulate matter another day. So you're saying sand is actually like a thing that's used? Yeah, why not? I've done it. Because it gets everywhere. No, no, no. Uh, water gets everywhere. You don't want like the sand where you blow and it's like a dust storm. You want the chunky volleyball type sand in like rains. It gets everywhere. And you take your cup and you shake it out outside before you bring it inside. Or you buy tungsten shot. <laughs> and what you do is you, you just do fine little particles until it moves on your haptic device, then you take your cup, you put it on your gram scale, you weigh it, and then that's how you know how much it was. Okay, parallels. Anyone know what parallels are? Show of hands? Half of you? Okay. So when you machine things, these are very useful. These are parallels, and what they do When you're machining, you have a vise. I didn't bring it up here because it's massively heavy. So these little parallels, those are the thin things, those are guaranteed to some ridiculously tight tolerance that they will be the exact same height. So then I could take another one and put it on here. And I know that these are, welcome to Sony. Thanks, Sony. No wonder you're going out of business soon. Short Sony. Um, so the surface of this is parallel to the surface of the base because I have two parallels. Okay? They're great for measuring things and seeing if things are actually parallel. Okay. If I wasn't parallel, what would th what's another common configuration I might be interested in? Perpendicular. Okay. So the first thing people run to for perpendicularity is this. This is not perpendicular. Don't use it. This is terrible. Plus, it's so thin that, like many models, you can't see when they turn sideways. So this is bad because I can't actually... I could cock it. See? Like, there shouldn't be multiple configurations for me to put this on here. There should be one configuration. Anyone know what the solution is? And does anyone know what this is called? It's a chunk of steel with a name. <laughs> I take, I'm, ju I'm just hoping you're all quietly answering correctly inside your own heads. <laughs> this is called a 246 block. Would anyone like to have to why it's called that? 2 by 4 by 6. What do you think its little brother is called? 1, 2, 3 block. So these are precision ground, they're extremely flat, they're extremely orthogonal, and look, there's only one configuration. If I do that, it's pretty obvious, right? And so what I can do is, say I'm making a robot made of cardboard boxes, I can see if this is actually perpendicular. And if it's not, I'll see a gap. So you put a flashlight on the back side, and then you can see the gap, and if you want, you can use a pin gauge or something to get down in there and actually measure it. So this 246 block is good not only for, for measuring perpendicularity, but for setting perpendicularity. So in my robot, I've got this giant Z post, and the only way that I make sure it's perpendicular is I put this on the base, then I put this, I have one person smoosh it against here, and then I tighten the bolts. I'm guaranteed this is perpendicular. 246 blocks. 
The holes are for holding it in place. So um, here's a terrible thing when you're doing stuff like this and you're measuring and then you go like that. Oh God, that was terrible. There's a dent here now. And if, it, if it's not your table, it's your robot. So the holes don't do... <laughs> About 150. The, um, you, and by the way, a lot of this measurement stuff is way cheaper on eBay. And it's actually, the only issue you have to do is shipping. So my first set of 246 box got mangled in the mail. But then they had to replace it because it wasn't my fault. So eBay is really cheap for this stuff. So um, a lot of the stuff like this for holes is just, I just want to bolt it in place so it doesn't fall over and crack my robot in half during, you know, installation. It's, that's the only reason. Okay. Since you mentioned parallels before, mm -hmm. I often see them being used in clamps. Is it just because they're flat? Or? In plants? No. <laughs> clamps. Clamps. Like, uh, you know, like holding something for the drill press or something? Yeah. yeah. So in vices? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, their, that's their main intended purpose, is in vices. So to draw that real quick, um, so in a machining vice, It'll, you'll have one side like this, and then you'll have another like this, right? And this one's free to move, and this one's grounded. So we would like a part sticking, say we want to machine some aluminum. We'll put the part sticking out. Oh, uh, I don't remember if anyone answered it. No one answered anything, so <laughs> you weren't correct or incorrect. Jello, anyone? I have spoons. Beef stroganoff ruined it, didn't it? <laughs> You want jello? Uh, strawberry or orange? I'll take orange. Orange? I'll take strawberry. strawberry. Don't say I never gave you anything. <laughs> okay. And then you can have a spoon. I'm going to put these other two within arm's reach of people. Here. You look like you could use jello. Okay. So I want to put a chunk of aluminum right here. Okay. I, I need to clamp it. But, um,. I need to clamp it and I need to expose the top surface for machining. So really the only way, but I, I don't want this to be at a bad angle when I clamp it like this. So what I do is I put two of the parallels right here. And I guarantee that it's sitting on something parallel. Everyone see that? Okay, those are parallels. Uh huh. So are the parallels like made of really strong material? They're just hardened steel. Most of the stuff is made of hardened steel. Anything exo more exotic than that and you wouldn't buy it on eBay. Okay, we're gonna get through today. Good, oh, pin gauges, the tolerance. Depending on what it is, it's roughly around plus or minus 0 .005 millimeters, just to give you an idea. So the, the relative precision from the other one, it's in increments of 0 .02 millimeters, but the tolerance around that number is 0 .005, so five microns. Okay, dial gauge. Now let's look at level. Yeah, let's look at level. I'm sure all of you have installed bookshelves at some point and you used, can you zoom in, Rob? The bubble, right? Okay, these suck. Stop doing that. So I don't, unfortunately, all I have is a complaint with no pro-offered solution. Um, this one's digital, so at least you're not reading the bubble. So for those of you who are being naughty, I guess about 10 of you and aren't here today, I'm gonna zoom in and show the bubble. Okay, see the bubble? Bubble reading is not a precise art. I don't want anyone doing bubble reading. <laughs> Point 0.3, can you see that at all? Not really? Yeah. Point 0.3 millimeters. And now I turn it up and it's 35.8 millimeters. At least it's a number and not a bubble. Degrees. Yeah, degrees. So. What I would do is I'm sure they make planar versions of these, or you could even go one step further and just get something that tells you where the gravity vector is, and you're just trying to get 001 for Z, right? Someone has extra assignment, find me basically a 3D accelerometer with a digital readout that I don't have to hook into my computer. Uh -huh. Can't you buy one of those laser ones? You probably could. I, I've never done it. All I know is it's important, and I don't know how to do it. I'd know enough to say bubbles suck, so I went ahead and got you guys a digital version. 
Now, why does this matter for building robots? No, I've got two, four, six blocks and parallels. So this shouldn't be used for like, like I shouldn't be putting this on one surface and then putting this on another surface and seeing if they're orthogonal that way because I have two, four, six blocks for that. The only reason to use a level is because even independent of an object, it knows just gravity is up and down and if I turn it that way, gravity is that way, right? It's not about relative perpendicularity, relative perpendicularity between two parts. It's about where gravity is. Why do I need to know where gravity is for robots? Gravity huh? Gravity balancing Counter, uh, counterbalances. So I'm going to go briefly over this just to tell you why you need a level. And then when we actually do counterbalances for realsies, then I'll come back and talk about it some more. Okay. What are the two main ways of counterbalancing something? Okay, springs is one. What's the other? Mass. And mass. These are the two main ways of counterbalancing. So I'll give you a few examples. Let's talk about mass first, right? So we have a plate. Let's say we put one mass here and one mass here, and we're some distance L2, M2, and then L1, M1. So M2, L2, or M2, G, L2 has to equal M1, G, L1, right? Could it be balanced? Okay, so we, we can play with it. We could have, you know, if we had an elephant sitting over here, we could have me sitting over here at a greater distance. Not that much greater, but a little bit. <laughs> and um, so that's gravity. Now what's nice about this? If I take this system, and I flip it up. So say this is my counterbalance arm right here, okay? Do I need a counterbalance for this? I'm not being floppy for fun. This is didactic. Anyone? Um, is it because your, your joint is limited? Well, yes, but in the free fall, I need a counterbalance, okay? Now this is one degree of freedom. Now I turn myself this way. Do, now do I need a counterbalance? No. I just free float this way. I'm going to turn off Sony. It's annoying me. So here, in this plane, I need ca gravity compensation, and in this plane, I don't. How about here? Yeah, I do need some, okay? Will this automatically take care of that? Yes, it will. Because, basically, um, the force has to be producing a lever arm in this degree of freedom about this axis in and out of the board. If I flip my axis up, both of them have forces that are now going into the board and so it doesn't produce a lever arm about the revolute joint. But if I turn them both at 45 degree angle, the, the fraction of, the gra of their mass which is still going into trying to turn is the same fraction for both. So a gravity, I call this, so a mass, a mass based counterbalance will work in any configuration. That's why they're so nice. It, I don't have to have uh, level because I can turn my robot sideways or at a random angle and they still work 100% of the time. Everyone get that? Even if this was at 45 degrees like this, both masses M1 and M2 would have the same cosine or sine on them. Springs use the same thing? No, springs are terrible because of that. What do you guys think would happen if you kicked over a PR2? Well, other than Willow owning your balls for eternity. <laughs> um, so PR2 is spring counterbalance to float kind of like this. Okay, It expects gravity to be up and down. So now if you kick over the PR2, like this, you'll go yoing! So let's draw that out. <laughs> um, so let's take a linear slide. Okay. So this is free to go up and down. And then I'm going to put a reroute pulley right here. And I'm going to take a cable. Oh man. I'm going to take a cable and over a pulley. 
And let's say this is one kilogram. So then what sh mass should I put here? Huh? You're screwing with me now. One kilogram. Okay. So this is, this is gravity. And this will work even if I turn it sideways, right? Okay. So now let's replace this. Does anyone know what a spring box is or a um, constant force spring? Let me rephrase. Has any of you tried to steal a cell phone from a Verizon store recently? <laughs> you know those little things that you pick up the cell phone and you're feeling sneaky but there's a string attached to it? Rob, can you zoom in please? So this is just a spring-loaded steel cable. And they use these, this one is a bit chunkier because it actually has a potentiometer on it. This is called a spring pot, spring potentiometer. It doesn't have to have the pot. Sometimes it's just, just for the springiness. And this is roughly a constant force. Now, when I mean roughly, I mean if we draw, if this is x and this is zero, so we're, we're pulled all the way in, and this is L for max extension, and this is force, it'll look, you know, Something like that. So, the, except the, the first and last couple inches, it's roughly a constant force. Just when it's first starting or at its end, it's not constant. So, other than preventing thieves, what we could do is I could hang some mass on this, and then regardless of position, I'm counterbalancing, right? Say this is one kilogram, which is not, but say it is, then my one kilogram mass would float wherever, it's, wherever I want it to be, right? Because it's a constant force. So let's put one of these on here. So I'm going to call this a little spring that way. And I'm not going to draw the rest because it's, it's, you know, it's a loop. Okay? So this is free to move up and down. This is one kilogram here. And then this is one kilogram force. Okay? Now, I turn this sideways and what happens? So now, so there's no mass pulling that way. But I still have my spring going this way, which means now I have one kilogram force going that way. Okay? Everyone see that? So this is now. Uh, so this is why springs, when you turn them sideways, um, gravity matters. Mass, it doesn't. Anyone know why we might want to use a spring instead of a mass? Springs are way lighter, right? If I need to counterbalance an elephant and I don't have a lot of room, I need another elephant. And then I have two elephants worth of a robot. That's terrible. That's my dissertation. So now we have springs, which are much lighter. But the issue is that if, if we misalign from gravity, we do the PR2, the wing, wing, wing. So that's why you use this. So basically, if you have a table and a robot sitting on it and uh, your counterbalance isn't working, then you take this out and you measure and say, hey, this is, this is at x degrees and it should be zero and then you pick up and you have some type of leveler to actually level the table so that your robot is aligned perfectly with gravity. Why would your table not be aligned? It's either the legs aren't even or in the Clark Center, believe it or not, the concrete floors are at random angles. <laughs> it's very bad for marbles. So I have a, I have a massive, massive like 20 kilogram constant force spring for the z-axis of my robot and um, it will kill your hand if it doesn't work. One sec. If and your robot is so super sensitive, can you have, like, can you design the base in a way so that it will keep it straight? That's what I'm talking about. Oh. So you can either have something passively that auto-stabilizes, that's like air tables that auto-stabilize in level, or you can get yourself a level, and then on your table, you build into your table little, little things that raise and lower each individual leg. So that's what I've done. I have a massive 80-20 frame with a robot on top, and I take out a level, uh, in my case it's a 3D accelerometer, and then I go in, I have a pallet jack to lift up my robot, I tweak each of the legs, I put it back down, read the measurement, and then I can converge even on a random you know, hillside, I can still make my robot aligned with gravity so the counterbalances work. Okay, we're almost done. Almost. Dial gauges. This is what we started with, so it seems fitting we end with it. Where's my dial gauge? Ah, here it is. Does anyone ever actually use these? 
Rob, can I get your help, please, and just zoom, uh, zoom in on the screen again? So, the first thing you should know about dial gauges is they're pretty sensitive. If you drop it, it's dead. If you ram it into the vise, it's dead. If you breathe at it weird, it's dead. So, be very careful. Okay. So, typically you'll use a dial gauge attached to a, a, either a mill or a lathe. Let's talk about a mill first. So, a mill goes X, Y, Z. I'm hoping that was a right-handed coordinate system. Um, so let's say we're going to put it here and we want to tell if our part is, is uh, level or not. So this would be level and then this is not level. So if I, put, if I clamp this to my, to my end mill, to my stock, and I move it across, I can watch that gauge. Now it should be at the exact same height if everything is level, right? And if it's not, then my needle is going to be going up and down. I can do it on a top surface. I can do it on a side surface. So... Before you start milling, you need to make sure that, that your vise is aligned with the X, Y of the bed. And this is how you do it. You take one of these little finger things, and then you, you take, say this is our vise, we undo the bolts a little bit, we measure, and basically whichever side is making the needle go more crazy, then we adjust the vise ever so slightly, tighten down a little bit, do it again, and we converge until when we're wiping this across all the surfaces, it's a constant reading. Now this is precise to half of one thousandth of an inch. If we were to put this on a lathe, say we had a sphere, uh, say we want to measure if this is a circular cup. If we put this uh, above it, we could do this on the mill too from above, and we put we put the little needle right here and it will measure some offset and now we spin it around I'm not very good at the spinning okay and the needle is going to start changing depending on what the rate the local radius of that cup is and so that's how we can take measurements that's called run out and we can take uh, basically measures of it of how good of a circle it is using a dial gauge so this is really common and this is how machinists calibrate their, their mills and their lathes to detect concentricity and orthogonality. Okay, that's good. Now let me check. We're almost done. So we talked about levels, dial gauges, jello, 246 blocks, parallels, digital scale, calibration weight, fish scale, screw pitches, pin gauges, inside micrometers, death range. We're good. So, are there any questions about any of this? So if, if the weights are exactly the same, but you start to weigh down one more than the other, then do you have to kick, doesn't the weight of the cable itself kind of... I would... Typically, the, the weight of the cable... So, I see what you're saying. So, if this one's way up here, we have a lot more cable yeah. up here. Yeah. So, um, the weight of that cable will almost always be lost in the stiction of your slide. So you'll never see it. So say your stiction is uh, two grams, but you only ever have a maximum unbalance between the cable lengths of one gram, then it doesn't matter. But if you were doing like micro manipulation, then yes, that would definitely matter. Anything else? Okay, I know today was kind of boring. I apologize. This is all super useful stuff. It's one of those things where like, you're not, you don't realize it was good until your stuff starts working because you're measuring correctly. If you do have questions in the future, I'm happy to answer them, but that's how to measure stuff. Uh, next Monday, we'll be talking about springs to start out, all types of different springs. Uh, lab 3 will go out as soon as I finish it. I was up until 4 a.m. last night, or I guess this morning working on it. I'll be doing that again tonight to prototype it. So probably tomorrow afternoon or night, I'll be sending it out. You'll have roughly a week to get it done. That leaves anywhere from three to four weeks for the final project. There are only three labs. And we're good. Okay, go get your keys.